Okay, so here we have a lot of the, uh, the inspiration posters. I was able to fit them all onto one thing. Then I might, because I'm on a Mac, use my view options. to make sure they're kind of squeezed together. And made as big on the screen as possible. So my spacing is already tiny, right? And then I'm just gonna do a screen grab. And on a Mac, a targeted screen grab is Command-Shift-4. And this makes it all one image that I can open in Photoshop. So if I, if I wanted to, I can steal colors from them. A steal inspiration from them. So right right now as I'm looking at it and I'm thinking about my my image, so I'm going to take that screenshot and put it right into my folder, right? So I have to think before I go further with my the coloring of my type and the creation of my poster, I have to think of my elements. I have this, I have this, and I'm going to make a poster, right? So immediately, which poster is the most satisfying visually to me? And to me, just at this size, just graphically, just completely satisfying is this one. I'm drawn to simplicity, right? This one and this one have a very similar compositional aesthetic. So does this one, right? They're similar to this one, similar to this one, similar to this one. So there seems to be a focal point in the upper in the upper half, right? Makes sense. So what I'm gonna do is actually open this image up in Photoshop. Because now I'm gonna show you, even though you can do all this in PhotoP, I'm gonna start moving things to Photoshop. And then we're really gonna examine it, like the most basic poster and some of the decisions it makes, right? So, first of all, this is a clean edged poster. It's a letterpress poster, so there is texture in the red. You can see the texture, the kind of granular nature of it. But the border is a really clean border. It's the proportions I think I want for my poster. So the first thing I'm gonna do is crop down to it. And this can be kind of my design template, right? I can clean up the edges and get those proportions by using the rectangular marquee tool, making a new layer, and then filling those marquees with white. But the problem is this is at a low resolution. So before I bring any of my elements into it and start playing with it, I am going to go to image size. And I know I have an image that's 10 inches by 10 inches by 350. So I want the poster to be these proportions. And I want the poster to be at least 12 inches, right? So we basically have the proportions of 12 by 16, and I'm gonna force that up to 350. And then this style sheet, you know, this just becomes kind of a sketch, but it helps block where my focal point should be for what I'm thinking, what would make a good poster. All right. So it's not about the color, it's not about anything, it's about the proportions and where I'm gonna put my focal point. So now that it's at the right resolution, I can go back and I'm gonna bring in my spot illustration, my finished PNG. And you see, it's already 10 inches by 350. So it's plenty large, but I'm gonna, by bringing it in, it automatically centers it and I'm gonna go ahead and move it up a little bit. 
so it feels balanced visually, kind of like this feels balanced visually. Remember, in Photoshop, if you use the crop tool, it will give you third lines. And third lines are a nice way to compose. So their little speech bubble image is perfectly on that third line, and it fits right in between these two third lines. That's why it's a really effective use of the space. For my illustration, I have a bulk of it on that third line, right? That's where the most interesting shapes happen. And then it touches, like the puddle is on the third line. So it's primary, secondary. And that's better than if it was centered. So I like that placement. I could probably get away with it being smaller. Right? And placed up higher. And because it's a smart object, I could do that and and then I could decide to make it bigger again and I will, won't ever lose quality because it's always referring back to the original image. That's why the smart object is important. That's why I saved that PNG and brought it in. Okay, the next is the type. So I'm going to bring my finished black type in and then I have to place it. It will automatically center as I bring it in. But then I have to decide, okay, what's the best placement for it? And I might actually decide I like it at that height, but I want to move both of them over to the left a little bit. So the type is centered and the chicken is centered and that this blood feels a little bit off-centered, right? It kind of draws the eye through a little bit more. So notice, whether I have a red background or no background, right, that's using the space well. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in a background that's just gray, because we don't know what the background's going to be yet. That's the next element I might want to play with. And then that background color and texture, that might really affect how I decide to color or texture my type. Or maybe I'll decide not to, right? So this is why the style sheet's so important. So if we go back to that style sheet, I'm going to actually open it up in Photoshop. That screen grab I took. And I haven't found a way to do this in PhotoP yet. But in Photoshop, you can actually look at them side by side. So the way you can do that is you go to Window, and you say Arrange, and you say, um, I'm going to do two up vertical. Right? So I can have this image over here and this image over here. And I'll give myself a little bit more space. And then that makes me think, okay, what kind of color would make sense for this background? And look at all the different choices. So there's the solid red, and that looked interesting, right? But this has more complexity to it than just that speech bubble. So maybe this, this ombre effect, right? The gradation. So why not just try it? We'll just do it with a, a gradient overlay. We'll go from dark to light. And I'll pick some colors. And I can go from dark purple, kind of like that example, to a light purple. This is actually what's amazing. If I'm in Photoshop, I can steal the color from anything in Photoshop. Right? I'll show you what I mean. So that's doing it as a gradient overlay. But if I make a new blank layer, and then I just use the gradient tool, which we used when we made a sky behind our cloud, right? I have to pick the colors, right? Well, because this image is open in Photoshop, I can pick this color right from that poster. 
say okay and then I can pick this color right from that poster and say okay and then I can paint that gradation gradation excuse me so it's going to go from dark to light I'm going to start at the top just go straight down to the bottom and I can see how that looks right if I'm inspired by that So that's an option. May, might make a new layer, and I might say, "Oh, I kind of like this this yellow ochre color." So let me just do a flat paint bucket and hold down Option to get to the immediately to the eyedropper and just steal that color directly, and then just paint it in. Oops. Select all because I duplicated instead of just making a blank layer. I need so I can use the paint dropper. So I'm just gonna delete this layer, make a new blank layer, and then I can just drop in that color. All right. And in some ways that fits a little bit better than the purple gradation, right? But maybe I can play them against each other. So I can take the purple gradation on top and set it at pin light. So I just have that subtlety or it's soft light. So quite subtle, right? But already that's helping a little bit. The, the dark here is countering the highlight on top of my spot illustration. The light here is, is contrasting the shadow underneath. So I would recommend against, you can always start with it, but I'd recommend against uh, a finished poster that just has a flat color background. First of all, because they don't print very well. And second of all, um, they're just not very satisfying visually. That's why a poster like this is only satisfying because it's printed by hand with letterpress and it has that texture in it. So the next element we can play with is texture. I was just seeing if bringing a little bit of that red in was interesting. In some ways, yes, but I don't know. So what I might do is show you how to do texture. So on my, my flat yellow layer, if I zoom in, and you can do this in Photo P, you can see how it's just solid one pixel color. But if I change its blending mode to dissolve instead of normal, and then I take its opacity down slightly, it will break up in a diffused pattern, right? Showing the layer underneath, which is helpful. And if I don't want that circle there, I'll simply duplicate it. And this is how I'll create a lot of kind of color textures to use in my own digital work. I'm just going to select around that speech bubble and then I say edit fill. But I don't want to just fill it with this color. I'll show you why. So I selected the color and I say fill with the color. And I pick the color and I say OK. And it looks OK, but then look. See, because it's letterpress, there's a lot of variation. And that's really what makes it nice whereas digital flat color is is terrible so instead of doing that just filling it with a flat color i'm going to say edit fill content aware at 100 percent normal what content aware does is like the clone stamp it samples everything along the edges of what i selected and it uses that content to fill it so as a chance it will fill it with something from the outside as well but mostly it does a good job and it will keep it a consistent texture and pattern and color. So you won't, won't get that, that weirdness to the edge. So let's zoom in on that and see. And now you can see the, the variations continue. And so you can't tell where I erased. All right, and you just have a, a block of kind of 